And I'll introduce Mike Hogan again, who's going to talk to us today about urban, urban agriculture and the local food system in Central Ohio. And I'll let uh, Mike begin with his slideshow. All right. What I thought we would do is talk a little bit about what urban ag is, why it's growing, what impact it might have on the community, um, maybe do a little comparing and contrasting of urban agriculture in Columbus um, with other um, Rust Belt cities, uh, post Rust Belt cities, and leave a little time for discussion. That discussion doesn't happen to have, have, have to happen at the end. If you have questions, um, you, you know, you feel uh, that are germane to the conversation, just and, uh, uh, you know, shout them out. Don't have to raise your hand or, or anything like that. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So um, this is one of my favorite photos of um, urban agriculture. Um, it, those of you uh, from Northeast Ohio might recognize the, the skyline of Cleveland. Um, this is what used to be um, the largest urban uh, farm in the United States. Uh, in, it happened to be in Cleveland. It's right on the banks of the Cuyahoga River, and, and most of you will remember what the Cuyahoga River is most famous for, you know, catching fire and, uh, you know, kind of the worst ecological disaster, you know, in, in history. Um, but um, I think it's really cool that, that on the banks of uh, uh, that environmental, uh, you know, catastrophe um, is this uh, urban farm that's growing food, healthy uh, fruits and vegetables um, to uh, uh, market to folks uh, in, in the city in, in Cleveland. Boy, I have no idea why this is not cooperating today at all. Um, so a couple things, um, you know, what do we mean by urban agriculture? When, when we start to think about urban agriculture, a lot of folks think that those are two things that don't go together, you know, that, that farming uh, or agriculture and, and urban environments really are um, disconnected. And if you really think about it, um, both the idea of, of urban areas or cities and food production really start to, to grow about the same time in history, about 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. You know, as man, uh, you know, moved away from uh, being a hunter-gatherer to uh, actually producing food, well, it could, they could support more, more people and more people joined the community. As they joined, more people joined the community, they produced more food. And really that was the rise of both uh, farming or agriculture um, and uh, the idea of urban areas or communities where people live together. Um, so, so that happened at the same time. Uh, historically, some cities have uh, always produced um, food in urban areas. You know, some examples of, uh, of countries that do that are Cuba and several countries in Asia, China in particular. Um, when they plan cities, they plan for agriculture production in the city limits, not even beyond what we would think about the Beltway, you know, in Columbus, but actually in the core um, urban areas. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that about um, 800 million people worldwide produce food in, in cities. A lot, a lot of that is in developing countries. In the United States, estimates are that about 15% of all food in the United States is produced in a metropolitan area. Um, probably not in the urban core. If you think about the Columbus metropolitan area, that includes uh, all the ring counties around Columbus, doesn't it? You know, Licking County, and Delaware County, and Pickaway County, um, some big ag counties where there's a lot of agricultural production. Um, they're, they're considered the, the metropolitan area. And so, um, you know, about 15% of all food in the United States is grown in, in a metropolitan area. Um, a couple of caveats I always like to, to talk about when we're, we're talking about urban agriculture. Some things we know is we know that we, we realize and recognize that urban agriculture is not the most efficient production systems. Um, if we were wanting to produce the uh, least cost food, um, it would not be in, in an urban environment. It would be in a more traditional uh, a rural, rural environment. But the benefits from urban ag come from differences in transportation and marketing and a whole bunch of other community benefits that I want to talk about. So what do we mean by urban agriculture? When we talk about urban agriculture at OSU, we kind of take a big tent view and think all these things on the screen are part of urban agriculture. People that grow food in their, in, in their home gardens, um, that's urban agriculture. Uh, some people convert their whole yards in an urban environment to, to uh, producing food or fruit uh, and call them yardens as opposed to gardens. Community gardens where people come together uh, in the traditional plot garden, people get a small plot. Um, that is an important part of, of urban agriculture. We have done a great job in Columbus of um, uh, quantifying the, uh, the production level and, and economic value of food produced in community gardens, but some cities have. And you can see up there, um, my example of the city of Philadelphia several years ago 
um, kept track of the, the food produced in their city community gardens. And they had 2 million pounds of food that was worth $4.9 million that was produced in community gardens. So community gardens are an important part of an urban um, food system and urban agriculture. And then the, the part of urban agriculture that's, that's growing the quickest at the, the steepest trajectory is, is that idea of urban farms, um, places that grow food for other people uh, in urban environments. And we're gonna talk a lot about that. Um, and, and then the, the last piece is, is kind of some specialty areas, um, things like aquaculture or aquaponics, where we grow fish and plants in the, in the same ecosystem or environment. Um, that's part of, of urban agriculture as well. Um, here's some photos of what you know it looks like. I always like to say it comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, you can see this, this photo here. This is a, a photo of a house along High Street in Clintonville and that I parked in front of one day. And, and around all three sides of this huge brick house, they had um, vegetables and herbs um, growing in, in pots. And uh, they were obviously growing a, a significant amount of food, more food than I think would be consumed by just the residents uh, of that house. Um, the, the photo down here in, in your left on the bottom, a picture of a traditional community garden where people garden together. And, and the photo on the, here on the, the bottom right is just an, an example of folks um, doing whatever they can uh, to grow uh, food in their in their their backyards or in their their urban properties. Um, here's some photos of some what urban farms look like in Columbus. Um, certainly a lot different than uh, you know the farms in, in more traditional urban rural environments um, that that uh, you you might think of. So why is urban agriculture growing um, right now? I think there's a bunch of trends that we can point to, and probably the biggest one is. The whole idea of uh, population shifts, what I like to call the, the new urbanism. Um, you can see there on the screen, since, since 2010, population in metropolitan areas is up by 6% and is down by less than a percent in non-metropolitan areas. Now, there's a little bit of blip during the pandemic in, in, in those, uh, those growth rates, um, but I really think that was very temporary and, and we'll continue to see continued growth um, in urban areas. And then what I mean by new urbanism is that uh, people that are um, people are finding value in living in urban areas. It's kind of the reverse of white flight, if you will, that, that occurred in, in many cities in the United States um, in, you know, probably from the 40s on uh, th through the 80s and, and 90s. But now people are wanting to move and intentionally moving to, to the city, uh, a lot of times for quality of life um, reasons. Uh, I know my, my daughter and, and my son-in-law uh, live in DuPont Circle in, in Washington, and and um, they, they wanted to buy a home, um, but they did not want to move to the suburbs. They don't want to own cars. They don't own vehicles. They, they, they depend on the metro. And um, so they had to make a decision on what type of home they could afford to buy in the core urban area so that they can uh, continue to, um, you know, live the quality of life that they want and, and not have to spend time on the road and burn fossil fuels driving a car back and forth. And so um, there's, there's a lot more people these days that, that want to move to urban areas. And it's not, it's not uh, just one age group. We see um, demographics in uh, the um, new young professionals, um, but we also see a lot of retired folks um, that are selling the, the, the three and four bedroom home in the suburbs and moving to the core urban areas uh, for, for quality of life issues. Another trend that we see is um, not so much here in Columbus, um, but the, the one trend we see in a lot of post-industrial cities like Cleveland and Toledo, um, definitely Detroit, places like Milwaukee, Buffalo, New York, is that there's a, an abundance of vacant land, land that used to be used mostly for housing, um, but, but is, has been abandoned in most cases and is not being used. Um, you know, the, the poster child for this is, is Detroit. Um, the city of Detroit, the, the population has contracted so much that they only need one third of the land mass in the city of Detroit. Um, that's all they need to support the population levels today. Um, and so they are, they are consciously um, going through an effort of, of trying to uh, move residential housing into certain areas um, and use other parts of the city for other uses. And one of the uses they've, uh, they've come upon is, is growing food, uh, urban agriculture. Um, they put in uh, orchards, uh, several, acre, several acre apple orchard uh, in the middle of the city uh, of, of, of Detroit. Um, I was on a tour there, an urban ag tour several years ago. It's probably been 10 years ago now. And they took us to neighborhoods that, um, you know, looked like a, a, a movie scene type of thing. There was, uh, you know, block after block of, of uh, uh, vacant homes and, you know, vacant schools and grocery store bo boarded up. And so, um, you know, urban ag is, is seen as a very productive and environmentally 
uh, useful way to use this, this land. Cleveland, uh, not as bad as, as Detroit, but at the height of the Great Recession, uh, Cleveland had something like 12,000 uh, uh, parcels in their Cleveland land bank, um, land that was abandoned and returned back to public ownership. Um, we don't see that so much in Columbus. Uh, we certainly weren't the industrial powerhouse that, that the, the, you know, the Cleveland, Pittsburghs, and, and, and uh, Detroit's were. Um, our, our land is a little more valuable than in, in some of those post-industrial cities, but certainly in those cities, um, that's a real driver for, for urban ag. And, and really, that's why we see Columbus kind of coming uh, to the table, if you will, with urban agriculture later than other cities like Cleveland. Um, and, and developing a, a little more slowly because we, uh, we don't have the, the level of uh, vacant, unyet, unused, or um, less expensive land that they do in other cities. Another driver is uh, food security or, or food insecurity, uh, if you will. Um, and food insecurity is, or, or food security is the ability for all family members to have enough nutritious food um, to meet their health needs uh, for the entire month. And um, food insecurity is obviously tied very closely to poverty. And certainly we have poverty in rural areas, but we also have a, a large number of uh, pockets of poverty in, in more urban areas where we have um, uh, greater densities of populations. Um, this slide is, is a, uh, a, a photo of, um, or a, a map of Franklin County. Uh, you can see the beltway here, 270. And what this is showing is the, the percentage of uh, residents by census tract that are eligible for SNAP benefits, nutritional benefits from, from the federal government. And you can see the, the darker the green, the lower the percentage of folks eligible. Uh, as you move into the lighter green, yellow, and then into the darker oranges, that shows greater concentrations of folks eligible for, for um, service. And, and, and obviously that, that, that's an indicator of poverty. And so you can see where the, the poverty is, is concentrated the most, it's, it's certainly well within the, the Beltway, and it's in our core urban neighbor, neighborhoods ar around the, the city of, of Columbus. Um, some other uh, trends contributing to the growth of urban agriculture, um, one is food access. Food access is, is different than food insecurity. And the best way to, to describe um, food access, I think, is to ask you where you shop for food. You know, when you don't go to the farmer's market in season, where do you shop for, for your um, food? And if you're like me, you probably shop at, at somewhere that looks like one of these uh, the four um, photos. Might have a different uh, sign over the door, um, but this is where a lot of us get our, our, our fruits and vegetables and other food. These are the types of places that folks in food deserts in some of our, um, you know, uh, census tracts with high rates of, of poverty um, shop. Uh, a food desert is, is defined as a neighborhood or a census tract, depending on whether it's, it's rural or urban, um, where um, there is not good access to a full service grocery that has fresh fruits and vegetables, unprocessed um, foods, uh, you know, more healthy foods. Um, these are actual pictures in the university district of places um, where residents um, told us they shop for food. Um, several years ago, it's been about six or seven years ago now, we were doing a local foods project in the Wineland Park neighborhood of Columbus. And we did focus groups with folk, with uh, residents to ask, uh, to understand their, uh, their relationship, um, where they buy food, um, how they buy food, you know, whether or not their food's insecure. And these were actual places where, where folks told us they, they shop for food. And you can see through some of the pictures, these places even target um, you know, folks with SNAP benefits or what we used to call uh, food stamps, okay? And, you know, these, these neighborhoods that are food deserts, they're also what we call food swamps, places where there's a proliferation of fast food restaurants. Certainly, there's nothing wrong with fast food restaurants, but you can understand that in a neighborhood, if you only have those corner stores that don't have lots of healthy options, and then the only restaurants you have are fast food restaurants that don't have a lot of healthy um, options. You can see it's a recipe for disaster relative to, um, you know, health um, outcomes related to nutrition. And then even if a neighborhood is not um, food insecure, technically, there may also be barriers that prevent people from accessing food. This is a photo of a Kroger store on, on High Street and, and King Avenue um, that was uh, being built uh, about seven years ago, uh, right at the end of that local foods project that I mentioned to you that we were doing in Wine in the Park. There used to be a very um, small, um, old, not very nice um, Kroger store there. I, I had been in, in it and, and very few fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the ones that were there were, were not high quality. 
Uh, there were fruit flies and, and damage, just not a place that most of us would want to, to buy groceries. Well, Kroger decided to, to demolish the store, build a nice new grocery store on the same site, just at the time we were doing this multi-year local foods project in the neighborhood. And so it was opening right when we were finishing the project. And one of our last food, uh, uh, focus groups with uh, residents in the neighborhood, we asked them, how many of you are now shopping in the new Kroger? And, and what we found was a majority of them said they weren't shopping there. And so that kind of, uh, you know, uh, we, we didn't understand that. And so we started asking them, well, why aren't you, um, you know, discontinuing buying from the corner stores and, and shopping at the full service um, grocery store? And what we found out that folks were telling us, I don't have transportation to get there. I have to cross several busy streets or I have six children. And how am I going to take six children uh, across several city streets, several blocks? Um, how are we going to carry home five pound bag of potato, a couple of gallons of milk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the, the idea I want to um, you know, leave you with is that even when uh, there is a uh, access to, to a, a grocery store in a specific neighborhood um, or, or location, there are barriers. We also, you know, when we started digging in, um, we, we found out that um, this neighborhood has one of the highest um, Section 8, uh, proportion of Section 8 housing or voucher housing. Um, we also found when we looked at the, at the data, uh, almost 75% uh, of all residents in the neighborhood did not own a car. They depended on public transportation. Um, we also found that, that uh, a majority of, of the households were headed by a single parent. Sometimes it was a single mother or a grandmother. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of barriers that prevents people from accessing um, food, even when location is, is not one of them. Okay. Some other trends contributing to the growth of urban ag, you know, the whole idea of local wars, people that will do anything they can um, to buy local as, as uh, you know, long, uh, uh, throughout the, as, as, as a long time in the year as they can. And we see this through um, several metrics, things like the growth of consumer supported agriculture operations. Uh, I'm gonna guess most of you are familiar with CSAs or community supported agriculture. That's where folks um, give the farmer uh, they buy a share in the farm and they pay for that before the season starts. The farmer has the cash to buy inputs. And then in exchange, the customer gets uh, a share, a box or a bag of uh, food products um, every week during the growing season. Um, CSAs, uh, kind of the, the popularity kind of has leveled off nationally, except in urban areas. In urban areas, we see um, heightened interest in CSAs and that heightened interest just was off the charts during the pandemic, uh, as you, you would expect. Some other metrics, um, you know, just the explosive growth of farmers markets. Farmers markets have grown exponentially over the last 10 to 15 years. Every community wants to have their own farmers market. Um, and, and this is driving some urban production, uh, opening more mo markets to urban producers. Uh, farm to School, if you're not familiar with Farm to School, that's a program where um, school systems buy um, more local um, food, uh, for their food service operations, for school lunches, breakfasts, and after school meals, and you know when they feed sports teams and, and other extracurricular activity type of thing, um, it's a win-win. You know they support the local economy and, and local farmers and local food producers, and they're at the same time they're improving the nutritional value uh, of, of of the uh, food offering for the the children. Um, also, we see that, you know, with other institutions, um, corporate uh, cafeterias, uh, restaurants, caterers, um, they all want to, they all place a value now on buying local, uh, buying more local, as local as they can. Um, certainly, we can't always um, supply uh, all the food needs, you know, from a hyper local uh, uh, location, uh, like the city of Columbus, one of the biggest school um, systems in, uh, in the state. Um, they, about five years ago, wanted to uh, develop a farmer school program, start buying more locally. Obviously, uh, farmers in urban Columbus or even farmers in Franklin County or even just farmers in central Ohio can't supply all the food needed by that school system. But what they do is they kind of draw concent concentric circles around Columbus and uh, just keep moving out further uh, to try to get uh, what they can so they can buy as, as local as, as they can. And um, another metric is, is, is we see a lot more direct marketing uh, by farmers. Farmers selling directly to consumers at a farmer's market through CSA, um, through mail order, through um, uh, delivery routes, um, you name it type of thing. 
And one of the reasons why um, farmers are interested in selling directly to consumers is because they can make more money, okay? Um, when we go to the grocery store, um, when we buy food items, not uh, you know paper towels and, and uh, soaps and all that stuff, but food items, um, farmers get about 16 cents of every dollar that we set, spend on food items when, uh, when, when they buy them in the grocery store. Um, the, the guy who prints the box for Wheaties cereal uh, gets more money uh, than the gal who grows the wheat that goes into the, the Wheaties cereal uh, for a whole bunch of different, different reasons, obviously. And so when farmers sell directly to consumers through a farmer's market, through pick your own, through farm stands, through CSAs, um, they can keep up to 95 cents of every dollar the consumer spends as compared to that 16 cents. So there's a, there's a heightened interest, interest on the part of farmers these days to sell directly to um, consumers. I should stop for a second and ask, are there any questions so far? All right, we'll keep going then. Those are some of the drivers of urban agriculture. What are some of the benefits? Well, I like to say that, you know, done correctly, um, we can increase uh, food security and food access when we um, locate um, agriculture in urban areas, especially in some high need neighborhoods in, in core urban areas. Um, a lot of times we think about, you know, when you think about urbanization, uh, Columbus is a great example, you know, um, at Lynn's Fruit Farm, you know, just, just over the line, is that urban? You know, we kind of tend to think that's more peri-urban um, than urban. Um, and, and certainly there are benefits of urban agriculture, no matter how urban the area is. But the, the closer into a, a really core urban, underserved, uh, impoverished neighborhood, we can locate um, urban agriculture, urban farms, um, the greater chance that we can have a positive effect on food security and, and food access. Um, I like to say that, that urban agriculture creates an oasis in a food desert and an island uh, in, a, in a food swamp. Some other benefits of urban ag, you know, um, especially when we, uh, you know, target children, um, but not, not just children, but adults as well, you know, it certainly promotes physical activity. Um, it can reduce the obesity rate, especially when uh, we consume those uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that we grow. Um, here's a couple of photos that I think kind of demonstrate that. The photo on your right, it's just a photo of a, uh, a typical uh, Ohio farmer's market. I think that might be the Clintonville farmer's market. And you can see the variety of, of fresh uh, vegetables that are available at farmer's markets. The photo on the left there of the two ladies working in a garden plot, um, that I took in, in Kansas City, uh, Kansas. Um, that is a metropolitan housing uh, 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 site. And you can see the, the small bungalow homes in the background. Um, those are the, the homes that the residents live in. They're, they're single family homes. And um, there's about a, a four block square area where they have these bungalow homes uh, arranged around this uh, central block of a uh, green space. And there's a small community building there. But in, in that green space, they also have a community garden. And every resident who lives there in one of those homes, they get a plot in the community garden. And I thought that was just ingenious. You know, when you think about gardening, it's great physical activity, especially for folks that are older and have some mobility challenges, right? Um, and at the same time, they're growing healthy food um, that, that, that uh, they're going to consume. Uh, you know, they're benefiting economically, they're benefit, benefiting um, nutritionally. And, um, and I asked the, the, the folks that were giving us the tour, you know, they don't force people to garden. It's, it's just they have the opportunity to do that. They, they give them seeds. They have tools that they can borrow and uh, they, they support them, uh, the garden. Um, but when I asked them about how many of the residents actually have a garden plot, um, it, it was a tremendous amount. I want to say it was close to 80 percent of all the residents were actively gardening there. So it's an example, I think, of, uh, you know, a, a, a benefit that's, that, that is greater than just a, a nutritional benefit. Uh, some other benefits of urban ag, um, it provides additional green space. We have more green space, we can reduce the urban heat island effect. You know, when you watch the news and, and uh, Jim Ganahl tells you it's, it's uh, 10 degrees uh, warmer downtown Columbus than it might be out in uh, Pickerington or Gahanna or wherever, um, it's because of the, the, the built environment and how it, it holds heat. And so if we can increase green space, no matter what that green space is, whether it's tree, tree canopy or gardens or an urban farm, we can reduce that urban heat island effect. And also the more green space we have, the more carbon we can sequester. I don't think I have to explain to this group the importance of, uh, 
of, of uh, sequestering carbon uh, uh, related to climate change. Also, additional green space means that we can reduce stormwater runoff. Stormwater management is an incredibly expensive and complicated proposition in an urban area. And uh, it was something that I was not familiar with uh, uh, directly until I started working in uh, the urban environment with urban agriculture. Um, and, and most of, uh, you know, if you think about the built environment, there's very little green space for water to infiltrate, um, to, to uh, you know, recharge the groundwater and not have to be handled in uh, through the stormwater system. And so uh, the more places that we're growing food uh, means we can, we can reduce the, the, both the cost and, and the environmental effects of having to uh, handle stormwater. Most of our community gardens and all of our urban farms um, usually harvest rainwater off of buildings, um, houses, um, and, and you know, that, that way they can cut down on how much water they have to uh, purchase through a municipal water system, um, but it also keeps water out of the, the stormwater system as well. Some other benefits of urban ag, it gives us a place to kind of recycle um, organic waste, keep it out of um, the landfill, a uh, place to, to, to recycle nutrients. Um, and most urban growers, both community gardeners and urban farmers, um, typically um, like to grow organic. Uh, most of them are not certified organic, um, but they use organic production systems and only use synthetic uh, inputs when, uh, when they have to to save a crop or, or they have no other alternative. Um, another benefit is, is these gardens and urban farms gives us uh, places where we can reduce uh, insect breeding areas in, in uh, the urban environment. I'll show you a couple of pictures of that as we go along. There's some other uh, you know, uh, benefits that are, um, have been uh, measured and, and uh, promoted by uh, different cities. Um, but you know, some of the human benefits, it, it kind of promotes a sense of community. People coalesce around um, not just community gardens, but urban farms. Um, we have an urban farm that's been farming about three years on the south side of Columbus. She had a very successful urban farm. She's got three land bank lots in a row, so a nice size urban farm. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, a neighbor came over and introduced herself to the farmer, and she told the farmer, she said, um, we just bought the house uh, over there that overlooks the farm. And she said, one of the reason we, reasons we chose that house over other ones we looked at um, was we thought it was really neat to be um, located right next to uh, your, your urban farm. And so what we see is even people that aren't involved with the community garden, they don't have a plot, um, you know, they, they just live next to it. They see a value in having agriculture close to, uh, to where they live. It can also decrease crime. Um, the city of Milwaukee has some of the best statistics I've seen um, where they, they, they measured crime rates before and after they put in community gardens and neighborhoods and they documented a reduction in in crime rates in, in those immediate areas. Uh, it can also raise property values. Um, uh, Cleveland uh, has data to show that. At the height of the, the Great Recession uh, in the, the, uh, about 2010, uh, the city of Cleveland had, I think, about 12,000 properties in their, in their land bank. And they, they quickly uh, realized that they had to get rid of those properties. They, they didn't you know, need to own uh, those properties. And um, the minute they started selling those properties and people developed them uh, for urban farms, for gardens, for new side yards uh, to existing properties, um, the property values in, in those neighborhoods immediately went up, um, they said. And, and they also reduced the cost of community services. When, when Cleveland had those um, properties that the, in the land bank, they were spending uh, almost a million dollars a year, something like $800,000 a year to mow those properties during the season. And they weren't mowing the grass weekly. You know, they were just mowing it a couple, three times a year to keep the, the weeds from getting to be three or four foot tall. And um, so if we can, if we can take those uh, unused properties and turn them into gardens and urban farms, we can reduce the, the cost of community services that can be um, spent on schools or roads or, or other types of things that are needed. Uh, just some photos of, of uh, urban ag in, in Columbus. Uh, some other benefits, as I mentioned, it repurposes vacant land, um, not so much here in Columbus, but in, in other cities. It provides jobs and improves the economy. I will tell you, it doesn't provide a lot of jobs. Agriculture, even in a more conventional uh, location, production agriculture, farming, um, is not very job intensive compared to uh, other industries. Um, but agriculture, and particularly urban agriculture, develops different types of jobs. It, it develops entrepreneurs, people that develop their own business. They're not clocking in and out for minimum wage at McDonald's or 
uh, you know, Walmart or somewhere like that. They're develop, developing their own business. And some of these people, you know, become serial entrepreneurs. They develop spinoff businesses. They add value to the, the foods that they're, they're producing. Um, so it's, it, it is a good source, uh, albeit very small, uh, of developing jobs and, and positively impacting the community. And it can also be a source of vocational training for certain audiences. There are some really great examples, one in Cleveland, one in Fairfield County on a much smaller scale, um, where um, they're using agriculture at the old developmental disability schools, the DD schools, uh, what they used to be MRDD schools, the sheltered workshops, where um, those folks used to learn life skills and did, uh, did some um, uh, uh, packaging or uh, uh, other manufacturing type jobs um, and were paid a wage and also developed job skills and life skills. Well, a lot of those jobs have been, and those tasks have been moved offshore. And a lot of the, the sheltered workshops didn't have a great um, place to um, industry type to, to, to continue training folks. And they've kind of found that, that urban agriculture, uh, where the residents can grow food, uh, can be a really good um, source of that training. And so Cleveland has a program called Cleveland Crops. They've got about, I think they're up to 10 or 12 greenhouses and hoop houses, high tunnels, where the residents, uh, the, the, the clients in the, in the DD schools are growing food and selling them um, to the community. Um, so it's again, win-win, you know, they get a, a wage, they are developing job skills and life skills. The community's getting increased uh, amounts of uh, locally grown fresh uh, fruits and, and vegetables. And so, uh, there's a smaller program in, in, uh, in Fairfield County where the sheltered workshop is growing uh, microgreens indoors in their facility, and then they market them to white tablecloth restaurants in Columbus and, and other places. And so it, it can be a source of, of vocational training as well. Um, here's some photos. I think they really demonstrate that. The two photos um, here on, on your right, these are photos of the Ohio City Farm in Cleveland, uh, where I opened up with that photo. And um, they uh, do a great job. They have, they've been growing food there probably for 15 or 20 years, but only recently did they um, develop this um, farmer's market, a, a stand at the farm, um, and started training uh, the folks who are growing the food uh, in business and marketing and showing them how to market um, on site. Um, if you're not familiar with the Ohio City Farm, it's, it's uh, right near the, uh, the West Side Market in Cleveland. So really um, kind of a, what's grown into a food district, a food hub, if you will, with not just the West Side Market, but a lot of restaurants and a, and a real foodie neighborhood. And so um, the producers there are capitalizing that. You can see in this picture, the lower picture here, there is still on the site one um, tower, uh, metropolitan housing uh, facility there where um, I, I forget how many hundred residents live there. And so obviously um, they try to take advantage of those residents living right next to the farm, but also they, they market to the, the greater community. And then these two photos on the left side, your left side is a, a photo from uh, Juniper Gardens. It's an incubator training farm in Kansas City um, where they have in, in a very uh, uh, urban neighborhood, they have several acres um, where they um, give uh, mostly new Americans, refugees um, that move to Kansas City. They um, give them a place to grow um, food that they can sell and earn a living or at least supplement uh, uh, wages for, for a living. They provide support and education. Um, and then after a few years, these folks graduate and move out of the incubator. And they don't just kind of jettison them. Um, they, they help them find capital if they want to buy uh, an urban farm so that they can uh, ha have a private enterprise um, or, or find land that they can rent, either a land bank property or other property uh, in the city. They, they help them access capital so they can afford to do that. And it's just, a, I think, a great model for um, showing uh, the, the benefits of of, of urban agriculture in, in a city. And then I, I think there's this whole realm that I like to call the human and community dimension of, of urban ag. Um, you know, urban ag really reconnects people to their, their neighbors. And I use that example of the, the neighbor of the urban farm. Um, and, and, and those connections are even greater when we have community gardens, when people garden together. Uh, you know, I, I gave you some examples of, of neighborhoods, uh, you know, becoming safer and property values increasing. Um, but there's examples of, of the, the, the human side of, of, of people, uh, you know, increasing the, the interactions that they, they have with their neighbors. Uh, I think it also gives folks a, a way to reconnect, um, you know, urban residents, uh, a way to reconnect with nature and the cycles of the environment. You know, if, if we expect um, not just young people, but society in general to to understand that you know the the, the tremendous uh, you know problems uh, we have to solve 
uh, on this planet, things, you know, you know, related to climate change and resource depletion and other environmental issues, what better way to have them involved, uh, you know, with the, 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 the cycles of nature and, and, and growing uh, plants? You know, there are some residents, most of us, you know, don't, don't uh, have the situation, but there are some folks who spend their entire lives in uh, the built environment. They really don't go out into, uh, you know, more urban areas where they see uh, you know, uh, far actual farms in rural areas or uh, green space or forests uh, like many of us do. Um, here's some photos I think that really just demonstrate that. The, the photo here on, on your right um, kind of showing, uh, now my cursor's not working anymore. This is really weird today. Um, but the photo on the right there, that, that is a workshop that um, we did on the, the far uh, east side of Columbus where a neighborhood I had a small community garden and they wanted to add a hoop house, a high tunnel so they could extend the growing season. Um, and so this was a two day workshop where they came together to build a hoop house for the community garden. The photo on your left there is a photo of a family in a community garden. I don't even remember where I took it, but I remember uh, thinking at the time it was so neat. You know, it looked like to me what was three generations of the family. It looked like grandma was there and mom and the children were there all working together in, a community, in their plot in the community garden. And then they couldn't even wait um, to get home. You can see they have a basket there they were filling to take home. I don't remember what they were eating, but they sat down and started eating the produce uh, because they, they enjoyed it so much. I thought it was just a, a great example of, um, of you know, the, the human uh, side of community gardens. Um, there are some concerns uh, that people have about urban agriculture. Um, not everybody, you know, especially a few years ago when uh, here in Columbus, when it was really uh, starting out in earnest, if you will, uh, are thrilled with the idea of producing food in uh, such, such close proximity to uh, dense, uh, densely populated neighborhoods. And one of the biggest concerns people have is, is folks think that agriculture and even community gardens, not just urban farms, but community gardens, um, attract wildlife and, and rodents. And, and really they don't, um, you know, uh, you know, folks think that their wildlife is attracted to compost piles and food growing in the garden. And, and really we know that, that we have wildlife living in the most uh, densely populated urban neighborhoods uh, in any city, including uh, Columbus. And, and really the, the, the effect on the, the level of uh, uh, wildlife populations and rodent populations is negligible when we add uh, urban uh, in the urban environment. Several years ago when we started to have some new urban farms in Clintonville and some new community gardens, residents were concerned. They, they saw increased rat populations. And so the University of OSU did a study um, looking in Clintonville where they could track um, droppings and, and where the, the, the uh, rodents, rats mostly um, were living. And what they found was attracting rats the most in Clintonville was bird feeders. And that's where they found uh, rats. They didn't find uh, rat feces and rats weren't attracted to, to compost uh, piles and, and gardens, whether it was a, a private garden or, or, or a community garden. And, and uh, you know, when we get calls from, from folks, uh, sometimes they're stakeholders like county commissioners or the health department, you know, uh, I always like to ask them, you know, which conditions do you think attract wildlife and rodents? The, the photo on the left there of the, uh, the abandoned lot that's in the land bank that's not mowed, it may have some tires on it accumulating water, or that same lot turned into a, a community garden or an urban farm. And, and once folks think about it, it, it makes sense that, uh, you know, uh, gardens and, and urban farms, uh, you know, uh, certainly it's not that wildlife do not visit them. Um, they, are, they are not harbors of, of rodents and, and wildlife like some folks think, think they are. Uh, some folks are concerned about food safety, producing uh, food in close proximity to an urban environment. We do have some issues, you know, in an urban environment that we don't see in a more traditional rural uh, production system uh, around soil contamination. Now in Columbus, the, the only soil contamination we tend to see um, is, is lead, and um, that's directly related to, you know, paint on, on uh, structures, houses, and, and, and other structures. And uh, we can typically deal with, with lead contamination, but in other cities, um, there is more widespread uh, contamination uh, issues from mostly industri industries. Um, again, Columbus not being that the, the post, uh, you know, the, the industrial powerhouse, um, we don't see a lot of it. Now, if, if you were to go and, and try to develop an urban farm on the south side next to the, the old Columbus castings plant, certainly there could be uh, some, some soil contamination. But that's an issue that we see in, in, in urban areas that we do, don't typically see in more 
rural areas. And then people cite uh, concerns about good neighbor issues. Um, you know, some people may not be as excited about uh, growing food uh, right next uh, door as, as you or I might be. Um, the photo here on the, the lower your left, you know, that's might be a perfectly acceptable compost pile uh, or composting system. But if that's 10 feet uh, over the fence from your neighbor's dining room window, um, is that what they really want to look at? And so really good neighbor issues are, aren't much different in an urban area, um, uh, you know, than, than in a more rural area. When we have um, residents that move out to uh, more rural areas, close into farm, it's the same type of situation, the, the nexus of, uh, you know, uh, home residences and, and production agriculture. And so what we, we, we do is we work with community gardens and urban farms to tell them, uh, you know, uh, how, how can you be the best neighbor? You know, instead of leaving supplies, uh, you know, uh, unorganized or, or piles of mulch or, or straw bales, you know, let's have uh, organized storage systems, um, you know, community gardens or even urban farm, depending on the number of people they're going to have, may need to have port and john facilities at certain months during, during the summer. And so it's, uh, it's just a kind of a thinking through, you know, how you can be a, a good neighbor uh, in the environment where we have a lot more people than we might have in a, a more uh, rural environment. Um, some other concerns, um, potable water. Um, the number one expense that urban farmers um, tell us they have is purchased water, okay? It's not labor, it's not land cost, it's not, um, you know, a purchase of seed or inputs, it's uh, water, uh, buying water from a municipal um, water system. Now, Columbus um, and most cities do have uh, uh, programs where um, if, if you can show that you're using the water to uh, water a community garden or an urban farm, um, they will charge you just half the price that you and I would pay uh, because half of the cost goes to um, sewerage. Not, you know, when, we, when we pay our water bill, we're paying not just for incoming water, we're paying for wastewater treatment, the outgoing, right? Um, and, and so obviously if we're using that water uh, in, a, in a farm or, or garden, um, we're not uh, having to process uh, wastewater at the wastewater treatment plant. And so they do um, charge them uh, half, half price. And so that's, that's a good thing. But um, having a source of potable wa water is important. Uh, you know, some folks think, well, we'll just harvest rainwater. Um, that's, that's obviously tricky, you know, when Mother Nature doesn't uh, provide enough uh, uh, moisture. And, um, you know, having uh, any, any size production, uh, whether it's a garden or an urban farm, um, you, you would have to harvest rainwater from a, a very uh, large um, uh, uh, building or number of buildings in order to have uh, the amount of water that you need. There's also some issues with um, storage of rainwater, of uh, microorganisms getting in the rainwater, in the, in the storage barrels uh, or cisterns before it's used. Some people um, have concerns about offsite movement of nutrients or contaminants that, you know, from, from a, a, a garden or a farm. Um, we really don't see that in Columbus at all. I think you'd have to be, you know, maybe on one of the um, ravines in Clintonville or, or somewhere else. Um, I mean, we did see this. I, I was on an urban ag tour in San Francisco a couple of years ago before COVID and folks were, were, were um, uh, gardening. Actually, it was an urban farm uh, on a, a couple of lots that had a, a significant slope to it. And they had to build some terraces and, and really take, uh, you know, had, had some practices to prevent um, erosion of, of soil and, uh, you know, offsite movement of fertilizer or any nutrients that they might be amusing. But we typically don't see that uh, here in Columbus and uh, haven't heard of it really being a problem uh, in Ohio. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the educational needs of, of new producers can be a challenge. Most of the folks we see getting into urban agriculture, they're not farmers. They don't come from a farm. Um, that can be a, a great thing because they think differently. They, they don't have that paradigm of how grandpa uh, grew uh, uh, vegetables or, or fruits, um, but, but they also don't have the educational background in agriculture. And so we do a lot of programming for new growers. Um, we, do a, we, do a, we teach a class just for urban uh, farmers called uh, the Master Urban Farmer Program. It's a 12 week class that helps people um, learn how to develop urban farms and urban food based businesses uh, in, in an urban environment. And there may be other concerns that, that I haven't thought of, um, but those are the ones we hear uh, most people are concerned about uh, most, of the, most, of the, most of the time. Um, I'm gonna, another, oh, I got a slide. This is really weird tonight. I have slides moving out of order on my screen, which I've never had. Um, there are some barriers to urban agriculture, um, not just in Columbus, but in other urban areas. 
Um, some of the ones that, that are most onerous are um, local ordinances and zoning. Uh, Columbus is a great example. The, the city has been, uh, uh, they developed a local food plan for the city of Columbus and Franklin County. Uh, they want to foster urban food systems and urban agriculture and urban farms within the city, but our zoning really hasn't favored it. And uh, changing the zoning ordinances is a very complicated and, and lengthy process. Um, the city of Columbus has started that process. Um, some cities have zoning that is very favorable to urban agriculture. Philadelphia, Baltimore are some examples where they change their zoning ordinances um, to make it the, the, the city more uh, friendly to urban uh, agriculture. Can I have your face, please? Oh my Say that God. again? Question? No, maybe it was talking. Okay. Um, also, our public policy has not um, favored um, not just urban agriculture, but small scale agriculture. Um, actually, fruit and vegetable production, um, non-commodity crops, our, our, our federal public uh, food policy really um, has favored large-scale commodity production, uh, corn, beans, uh, oil seeds, wheat, grains, um, dairy, um, and it's only the last couple of farm bills over the last 10 to 15 years um, have we seen USDA uh, programs, both funding um, and, and other programs to help um, develop urban agriculture, uh, small scale production, um, and, and, and programs that really favor production of more healthy foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, corn that is uh, used uh, to develop high fructose corn syrup that goes into Fritos and Mountain Dew and things like that. And then another barrier is that we, we haven't had a lot of research on, on uh, production topics in urban environments for, for different crops. Uh, you know, for, for more than 100 years, our land-grant universities uh, have been conducting research on, uh, uh, on, on growing uh, crops and, and, and livestock and, and fiber and even fuel um, in more conventional settings. And it's only in the last few years um, that we've seen research projects um, looking at what's the best um, way to grow food in, in an urban environment. And we had a, a faculty member at our, OER, at our uh, Worcester campus uh, a couple of years ago that um, took a vacant dorm that they were going to tear down um, and he got them to uh, allow him a, a couple of years to do some research um, on the um, cement uh, parking areas and on the grass around the dorm and a little bit inside the, the building um, to see wh what's the best system for growing food in an urban environment. Um, can we grow food on a lot of these abandoned parking lots right on top of the blacktop or cement or are we going to have to dig out uh, that and, uh, you know, uh, add some soil. Um, you can see the, the lower photo on, on your left there. He even had some pretty good sized fruit trees in containers uh, with trickle irrigation, looking at, you know, are, are there ways that we can produce uh, food in, a, in, in an urban environment? And uh, most of this research is fairly new. Um, and, and, and so, the, you know, the, we don't, we just don't have the experience in the, the background in, you know, a lot of it yet. But I was asked if, if, you know, urban ag is just kind of a fad, you know, the, the passing fancy, if you will. Um, and I really don't think it is. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of folks and, and, you know, the pandemic really affected this. Uh, people really um, have a firsthand knowledge now of how fragile, not just our, our uh, uh, you know, supply chain part of the food system, but, but just our food system in general, you know. Uh, you know, when a meat packing plants closed down, you know, for just a few days, the effect that that has on our, our food supply. And so um, I, I think people understand that that ag can be a, agriculture can be and food production can be a tool um, to redevelop certain um, neighborhoods in, in urban areas and positively uh, impact um, local uh, communities, if you if you will. Um, you know, we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, when there are neighborhood redevelopment projects, uh, many of them want to include agriculture, whether it's a farmer's market or a community garden or, or an urban farm. Um, we've even worked with a couple of developers that are building high rises here in Columbus, and they're asking for assistance on how they could develop rooftop um, community gardens for the residents uh, in those buildings. So I really don't think it's a, a passing fad. I think it's something that'll, that'll be with us for a while. A couple of years ago, we had a new dean in the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences, and it was about the time that we were really start doing work and, and programming in urban agriculture throughout the state, mostly in Cleveland at that time. And, and our dean said, you know, well, how much food do you can produce in cities? You know, is urban agriculture really viable? And so we had a, a couple of researchers uh, in the College uh, of Ag that did a research project uh, in Cleveland. And what they did is they collected data 
um, in Cleveland uh, on two fronts. They looked at all the vacant land in Cleveland, um, truly vacant land, not park land and, and you know, uh, other green spaces, but land that was in the land bank and other, other um, vacant lands and a few large rooftops that could support rooftop gardens. Um, so they collected that data using GIS and they had that information. And then they overlaid that with data that they purchased on food purchases in the Cleveland census tracts or zip codes, if you will. You can buy food data that shows you by census tract um, how much uh, people spend on um, different foodstuffs, bakery items, meat, dairy, um, fruits and vegetables. And so they looked at the, the, the fruits and vegetable purchases and some other purchases, food purchases in the Cleveland zip codes. And they compared that um, to the amount of vacant land that was available in Cleveland. And what they found was that if you just used 80% of the vacant land in Cleveland, they could produce 50% of all the fruits and vegetables that were being purchased in those Cleveland zip codes or census tracts. Now, we know that people probably go out of the, their census tract to go to the Costco, you know, out by the Cleveland airport or whatever, um, to, to buy food, but um, that is still significant. Also, when you think about, there are some fruits and vegetables, we're not, never gonna grow in Ohio, right? We're not gonna grow citrus. Uh, you know, we're not gonna grow avocados and mangoes. Um, so 50% of the, the fruits and vegetables that were being purchased in those zip codes is, is tremendous. That same land they found could supply 25% of the poultry and eggs being purchased in those zip codes and also 100% of the honey. So this, this was some of the first um, research nationwide, really, that showed that urban agriculture could be viable and could be uh, you know, a, a way to, to uh, produce a, a significant amount of food uh, in, in an urban environment. And then kind of lastly, you know, sometimes I think we forget uh, you know, what agriculture is all about. Certainly it's about food, but it's really about pe people, right? I mean, think about the word agriculture, the culture part of agriculture. It, it's about people. There's, there's, is there really anything like food that binds us together, uh, you know, as, as a species? And, um, you know, ur urban agriculture, you know, really uh, maybe more so than more large scale uh, uh, rural convention agriculture has the ability, I think, to bring people and neighborhoods and communities together uh, more so than, than some other uh, production um, systems do. And so, uh, you know, our, our dean was, was, when he asked that question, you know, he was asking, you know, could cities feed themselves? Could enough food be produced in a city to, to, to feed themselves? And um, what, uh, you know, what we like to say is um, we probably know that we're not going to, American cities aren't going to feed themselves, they're going to be able to produce enough food uh, to supply all of the food needed in that city. But we know we can produce, we know we can produce enough feed to, Ugh, produce enough feed to feed it. <laughs> it's late at night. We can produce enough food to feed a family. We know we can produce enough food to feed, um, you know, perhaps a neighborhood. Or we can produce enough of a certain kind of food, uh, you know, part of the food supply for an entire um, city. And so um, we know it's not not the uh, the solution to food insecurity or all the problems that we have with the the um, food production system but it's, it's kind of a piece of the puzzle. The photo on your screen there is of an urban uh, farm in New York City. Uh, you can see the skyline of Manhattan in the, in the distance there. This is the Brooklyn Grange Farm. It's atop a building uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, I actually was uh, born and raised in, in Brooklyn in New York City. And uh, I, I always think, you know, if, if, if we can grow food in uh, you know, one of the most densely populated cities in the world, one of the most expensive real estate in the world, um, we certainly ought to be able to do it in places like uh, Columbus and, and Cleveland and Dayton and Cincinnati and, and uh, Toledo and places like that. Uh, there's my email if you have questions uh, or something you wanna discuss. Uh, also, there's our website that gets you to our main uh, OSU extension uh, website. How about some uh, questions or comments or discussion you guys might have? Um, can you speak to the uh, prevalence or phenomenon of some restaurants deciding to raise, obviously not all, but some of their own food? I'm thinking like the crust up the road has a rooftop garden. Um, I've heard of others that are like we grow our, our food fresh and obviously they can't grow their own cow. Right. 
Yeah, no, it's called hype. That's hyper local. You know, we talk about local food system development. That's hyper local. Um, you're right about the crest, um, the um, the Renaissance Hotel, the the restaurant in the Renaissance Hotel in downtown Columbus. They have a rooftop garden. I think they're mostly growing their herbs. The chef has decided, you know, uh, like you said, he certainly can't pr produce a significant amount of food, but herbs uh, he can grow uh, exactly the herb he herbs he wants to use in the food, and I think they're using them in, in cocktails in in the bar as well. And so, yeah, it's a it's a great idea. There's a lot of interest. Uh, you know, Columbus has has a lot of great restaurants that are doing a really good job with uh, farm to table. Um, North Star, the North Star Food Group, the the North Star restaurants, and uh, Third in Hollywood and Brassica. Those are really good examples of um, restaurant tours and chefs that have a commitment to to buying local. And uh, and again, we we know that um, you know they they can't um, buy uh, everything they need certainly in in Lake County or even Central Ohio. Um, but just, you know, committing to, uh, you know, more local sourcing when they can. Sometimes that local sourcing is, is just Ohio. Um, Ohio State University, for example, they spend about $23 million a year on food to serve in the dormitories and food service and athletic facilities. And um, they, we have a goal at the university to um, purchase a minimum of 40%. Of, of all food purchases locally by, uh, I'm gonna forget the year, I wanna say it's 2025, it's not that far out. And so there's there's a, a, a real uh, high level of interest on the part of a, a lot of institutions, not just restaurants, but uh, you know other, other food service uh, uh, institutions to um, buy more local when they can. That'd be another question. You said that, um... Columbus Public Schools wanted to buy local, so they were kind of drawing circles and and, and going out and uh, trying to get as much local as they can. Um, and with the other institutions trying to do that, is there any is there any rule or guideline or measurement if you say your restaurant uh, sources 100% of their food locally. What is local? Yeah, that's a great question, Billy. And it's about like um, nailing jello to a tree. There is no, uh, there is no one accepted definition of, of local. The United States Department of Agriculture um, doesn't even have a great definition of local. What, what, um, the definition that most people kind of tend to agree on, or at least hang their hat on, including the USDA, um, is that food that is produced within a day's drive or 400 miles from where it's consumed, okay? Um, some of you may be familiar with the concept of food miles. Um, food miles is, is, is the number of miles between where food is produced or grown um, to where it's eaten, how it gets on your dinner plate. And on average, in the United States, um, the average food stuff that we eat has uh, six, more than 1,600, travels more than 1,600 miles, okay? Um, and, you know, when you think about where it's grown, where it's processed, where it's marketed. And so, um, you know, the idea is, you know, if we can reduce that and become more local, you know, I like to think of local foods, Vilni, as may, maybe not, uh, you know, a destination, but a journey, you know? Um, we can't all of a sudden, you know, change this multinational um food system into a more local and regional food system like we see in some other countries like Europe in many places. Um, but we can certainly chip away at it and, and work towards that. Um, you know, an example, you asked about the Columbus school system. So they realized early on, okay, we, we can't buy all our food from, from uh, farmers in, in central Ohio or Franklin County or even uh, you know, uh, the metropolitan, uh, you know, area type of thing. So what they did is they picked off some food stuffs. Okay, are there food items that we, we can buy specifically all local? One of the first ones they did was they were buying a lot of apples. And what were they buying? They were buying those red delicious apples that sat in uh, storage in Washington State and, you know, that you get at the hotel or airport and that most of it's thrown away and it's not eaten the way we eat a fresh Ohio grown uh, honey crisp or uh, pink lady or gala apple, right? And so they, they said, okay, that's something that we can purchase completely locally and, and close to Columbus. Um, they started dealing for their meats in, in uh, purveyors that were buying primarily 
from Ohio producers of beef and pork and poultry. Um, and they made sure that the, the, uh, dairy, the, where they were getting their milk and dairy products, um, that a great proportion of those folks bought from Ohio growers. That's kind of the approach that OSU is taking. Um, you know, for OSU's definition, local is anything grown or produced in the state of Ohio. And, um, you know, and so what a lot of restaurants and others have been doing the last several years, you know, they're, they're not going to not work with the U.S. food services and Cisco's anymore. They have to deal with those folks. But they're asking those folks, what percentage of food can you sell us or do you buy is from uh, local growers, Ohio growers? And the U.S. food services and Cisco's, um, even the fruit and vegetable uh, purveyors, they've really had to change their business model and increase um, their, their purchases from um, local growers. Sometimes that uh, ends up with uh, higher prices, um, but usually consumers uh, kind of, um, you know, they vote with their dollars usually, and there, there's a large segment of the population or consumers that think that's, that's a good thing. Now, your other question is only about, you know, what constitutes a, uh, a farm to table restaurant, you know, or a restaurant that says we buy, uh, you know, from, all of our, from local growers. I, I, I know some farmers that have uh, gone into restaurants and sat down and saw their name on the menu. We buy from X, Y, and Z apiary or, uh, you know, uh, uh, meats. And um, they said, we, we, we don't sell to this, this place. And for years, I really thought here in Columbus, we need some sort of um, almost like an organic certification system uh, for growers. We need a farm to table certification program that um, you know, growers can show their efforts in, in buying locally. Now, I, I'm sure most farm to table restaurants try to do a, a good job, uh, but there are some folks that are just capitalizing, uh, using it as a marketing tool and really don't have a commitment to purchasing local. I was in, I was in a, a farm to table restaurant. It was fairly new. I'm going to go back four or five years probably by now. It was fairly new. Um, I had to buy lunch for a meeting I was going out in the community to, so I wanted to support this new restaurant. I knew, knew of the guy that opened it. And so when I went in, he, I had ordered, pre-ordered. When I went in, he was actually there. And so I introduced myself. I started talking to him. This was like April-ish, early spring. And so I asked him, what are you buying locally? Well, not much. And the name of the restaurant was Farm to Table, you know? And uh, I said, well, you know, what you know, what could you buy locally? And he said, well, there's not, not much to buy yet. And I said, boy, greens, kales, you know, I ticked off six or eight things that I was going to an urban farmer meeting for lunch. So I was buying lunch there. Um, so unfortunately, there are some people that, that use it as a mark, not much more than a, a marketing tool and don't have a real commitment to purchasing locally. <clears throat> I, I want to make a comment and ask a question, uh, Mike. I know you mentioned the North Star restaurants. I happen to know them, the owners, and uh, they, in fact, actually go and visit local farms, and and they so they know their farmer. You know the classic uh, approach. But I wanted to contrast that when you mentioned the food miles, because when you go to the North Star, they're cooking and you you know making food pre preparation right there in the kitchen. When you go to a uh, Applebee's or uh, uh, Chipotle or whatever, they're, that's where the, sh the food miles come in because uh, they're just they're freezing the food and they're heating it in the in the restaurant. Big difference. And so you've got to be thinking about you know where you're eating. It, it's a difference, and uh, that's another reason for for doing the North Star uh, and those who are sincerely and uh, trying to be as sustainable as they can. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. I was at the Green on the Green uh, uh, event the, in Worthington uh, last Saturday, and I visited a farm that does uh, hydroponics. And I have heard about, about this issue and I asked him, I said, and I'm asking Mike now, because I don't know the answer to this. Uh, is there a difference in the nutritional value of a, uh, a hydroponically produced lettuce, for example, where I, it was delicious. I, I had some, they were giving it away right there, put a little lemon on it, very good. Uh, but I've heard people in the organic farming world say, no, it really needs to be in the soil. And there's all this talk about the microbiome, the soil, the microbiome there is the microbiome in us. And I, I just, I don't know the answer. Do you have any thoughts about yeah. that, Mike? Yeah, and so I'm not an expert in that, but I've seen very, and there are more, there's more data, Chuck, to show that um, organically produced food in a more conventional 
production system, not in uh, you know uh, hydroponics or aquaponics, really is nutritionally not different from food that is not grown in, a, in an organic system. Um, there, I've seen a very little data that shows that um, uh, greens, uh, particularly greens grown in a hydroponic setting are, are not nutritionally different from uh, the same crop not grown in, in that system. I get the whole idea, you know, the whole uh, conflict uh, in the organic certification uh, world about, you know, really can somebody be certified organic if they're not growing in soil, if they're, they're you know, supplying nutrients, you know, through, through the, uh, the, the water. Um, but, but I haven't seen a lot of, I, I can't say it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen a lot of um, data on that. It's interesting. Other questions, feel free to unmute and uh, ask a question. We get another 10, 15 minutes. I will mention, um, you know, uh, the, the question you asked, Chuck, we have a right now, uh, just uh, a few hundred feet from where I'm sitting at the office, <clears throat> the university is building a, a huge $45 million um, controlled uh, environment agriculture greenhouse uh, where uh, research will be done on, uh, you know, answering some of the questions you, you, you were just alluding to, Chuck, but um, um, showing how to grow and, and uh, not just demonstrating, but researching, uh, you know, vertical indoor agriculture. Um, we see, uh, you know, the proliferation of, of indoor agriculture, particularly in urban areas. Um, and uh, we're going to have this tremendous research facility here. It's going to open up at the end of August. Um, OSU hired one of the, the, the world's renowned uh, researchers on uh, controlled environment agriculture. Um, she used to work at Arizona State, and she's she's been here a few years. And uh, it, the, the facility that's being built here is really going to kind of be a game changer, I think. And I, I think uh, uh, probably 10 years from now, we'll start to see the proliferation of more indoor agriculture, uh, not just in Columbus, but throughout Ohio. I mean, we have examples of, you know, large um, greenhouses in some areas of Ohio, but we really haven't seen it in our urban areas um, like they have in some, some other states. I'll just, I'll comment that uh, I know uh, uh, my wife used to work in Westerville schools and uh, the science teachers there uh, just made a decision to start growing food. And they did it as part of the science curriculum and they had developed all these measurement systems to, uh, uh, you know, and they, they, they produced you know, tomatoes and greens and uh, microgreens, sold them to local restaurants in Westerville. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I know that's a trend of some level that's uh, going on for actually treating that as a curriculum in the school. I, I would love to see more of that. And I know that there are chefs and I think the Granville uh, school system, I mean, um, yeah, school system. Yep. They have a yep. chef who has made a yep. great commitment to buying local. So more of that is hopefully going to happen. Yeah, yeah. We have a huge school gardening program, um, and uh, obviously Granville is kind of Mr. Redding. There is kind of the poster child uh, for uh, they, they were doing it long before many other schools were. But even in uh, the city of Columbus, Columbus Public Schools, they have 145 buildings. Um, they now have school gardens, I think it's up to close to 60, and um, doing a really good job of, you know, um, uh, uh, teaching, using uh, school gardens, uh, you know, as, as a teaching tool, um, but also trying to, uh, you know, get a little bit of the food that they use in the cafeteria uh, as well. But yeah, school gardening is, is big right now everywhere. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Uh, I have one other question I was um, I'm going to ask for my wife. She said that um, uh, we have in our neighborhood these little, I guess, some kind of maple trees that are producing huge amounts of these helicopter seeds that are just literally it looks like a windstorm or a snowstorm, a hailstorm. Yep. What's, the, what's the story on that? Is that it happen? It doesn't seem to have happened every year. I've lived here. No. So that's actually an unexplained phenomena. People have researched that, and there really hasn't been a, a consensus of why that happens in certain years. There, there used to be the thinking uh, sometimes before a uh, a large mature tree, um, when it's on the decline and it is not in good health, um, it will produce a, a large amount of mass. You know, uh, you know, uh, like you, you're seeing this year. Um, but but the, uh, 
that's not the only time that, that they do that. So really, um, scientists don't un understand what makes a tree um, have increased seed set, uh, like the, uh, the, the, the maple mass that you're, you're seeing. It's fascinating. I think, in fact, I was walking my dog this morning and looking at the trees, and they do seem to have some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what it is, some kind of fungi or fungus associated with the tree trunks. So maybe that is a factor. But as you say, that's not the only thing, that, uh, the only reason. So it's a mystery. Right. Not everything is understood in nature, is it? <laughs> That's for sure. It remains a mystery. Uh, I want to say a quick, uh, since I've got a few minutes left here, uh, August 13 and 14, the Simply Living is going to be sponsoring a uh, our Simply Living uh, Sustainable Living and Garden Tour again this year. And we're excited that uh, we'll have a number of master gardeners available to ask answer questions. Our committee includes... Uh, Scott McKay, I mean, Sean McKay, who's uh, the new uh, manager at the Franklin Park Conservatory Growing to Green program. And he took uh, Bill Dawson's place. I'm sure you knew Bill, Mike, but I think uh, I, he has a great background in horticulture and uh, uh, he's helped us identify some community gardens and his own home, which has a, an amazing amount of uh, uh, growing uh, things there it will be on the tour, as well as Deb Kanapke. She will be on the tour again. She was on several years ago. She's the Garden Sage. Some of you have heard her on Ann Fisher, and uh, we're excited to have her. Uh, anyway, I won't go on and on. We'll be announcing more details. We're working on the committees, working on the brochure, and the, we'll have at least eight locations. And on Sunday, we're going to have a, a special workshop at Kevin Eigel's farm in Galloway, Ohio. It's an optional thing. You don't have to go to it. But Kevin is the, uh, the owner of the uh, and developer of the Eco House Solar Program. And he's been involved in uh, uh, solar panel installations. He's done over 500. He recently sold his business to IGS, uh, which is a family owned business in uh, northern, I think in Dublin, maybe. Uh, but he's uh, has a passion now in native plants, and part of his workshop will be on native plants. And uh, he's also done amazing things with his home. Uh, for those who've had the pleasure to go out there and check it out, his farm is amazing. And he's uh, he's been kind of at the forefront of all of these changes. So that's exciting for people who want to choose that option when we finally get our announcement made. No, we've got a few months, so we're working on it. Chuck, there is a question in the uh, in oh, the chat. Someone's, someone's asking what fertilizer is best to use on home food oh. garden, um, and it really, you know, it, uh, there really isn't a best fertilizer per se. Um, most uh, crops that we're going to grow for food are going to need, uh, you know, three macro uh, nutrients: nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Um, you can get organic um, uh, sources or, uh, of fertilizers or synthetic sources. Um, but really the trick, the only way you can know what fertilizer to use, what fertilizer you need is to make sure you get your soil tested. Um, we do that here at OSU Extension uh, in Franklin County. Most county extension offices do that. Um, it's only $11 per sample. We normally think you only have to just test your soil uh, once every three or four years. And so uh, if you've never tested your soil for your garden, that's probably a good thing to do. Uh, that's the only real way to, to determine how much fertilizer you're going to need or if you need to correct pH. Obviously, um, all green plants are gonna uh, need nitrogen. Nitrogen doesn't last in the soil. We can't store nitrogen in the soil like we can with phosphorus or potassium. And so every year we've got to supply uh, nitrogen uh, to uh, almost any crop. Some, some crops obviously are high nitrogen feeders like tomatoes uh, and, and even corn uh, to, to, a, to a degree. But um, you know, and I don't think the source of fertilizer is as important as understanding how much fertilizer um, is needed by your specific soils and the specific crop that you're growing. And I think the uh, that's an argument for uh, backyard composting. We've done that for years, and it's just a miracle. You know, you put that stuff out there every other every few days, and when it's time to uh, put the shovel in the in the compost, it's just amazing the rich <laughs> the rich uh, compost that you can then spread over your garden, uh, yep. and you can have. Uh, 
plenty of tomatoes using that old old system. Um, yep. Compost is a great source of organic matter. There is no yeah. better source of organic matter. Um, compost is not going to supply all the nutrients we need to grow most plants. Um, it's, it's, it's mainly a source of organic matter. You get some nutrients, some fertilizer from, from compost, but the real benefit is the organic matter. Well, I, I think we can wrap it up here. Any last questions? I want to thank Mike for uh, doing this. We'll end the recording shortly and uh, make it available. We'll, we'll get that link out there for those who weren't able to come in person. Uh, and again, I mentioned we had like 31 people sign up and I think people, it's no good day to have these things, you know, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, <laughs> maybe Friday, but uh, most people are not ready for a Zoom on Friday evening. They want the weekend to happen. So anyway, I appreciate very much, Mike. And uh, sure, anytime. Everybody who, who came and uh, you can save the chat if you like. Uh, the little three buttons on the bottom will do that. I'll save it. So we have it. And again, many thanks from everybody. Hi, Paul. Good to, good to see you. And uh, uh, I will end the recording if I can find the recording button. Uh, <laughs> I can never see these things when I want to do them. Okay. Hey, folks. Well, thanks, Mike. It was informative. Absolutely. Thanks again. Oh, I think I see it.